My name is David Torrens. I'm the owner of New Alibi's Bookstore in Belfast. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight to the Crescent Art Centre for the launch of Maria Cahill's Rough Beast. Um, before we start, I'd just like to say a few thank yous. Thank you, first of all, to the Crescent. Um, one of the finest community literary venues, arts venues in the city, and thank you for hosting this event. Um, I want to thank Head of Zeus, the publisher, and in particular Simon Hess, um, the Irish agent for Head of Zeus in Ireland, who's been so supportive of everything to do with this book and everything to do with books relating to this part of the world that they publish. Thank you, Simon. Um, order of events. Um, Neil Belton, editor-in-chief of Nonfiction at Head of Zeus, will be saying a few words of introduction. And then um, Eamon McCann and Maria Cahill will join the stage, and Eamon will say a few words, um, an introduction, and talk about the book. And then Maria will be talking and doing a reading as well. Um, and then we will be retiring for beverages and selling books, of course, and signing out the front. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Neil Belden to join us. Thank you. Good evening, and thank, thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see so many people. Um, I, I haven't been back in Belfast since uh, Kieran Carson's funeral, uh, which was a sad and but beautiful and wonderful event about four years ago. Um, tonight is uh, an extraordinary moment for me as a publisher. Um, about two years ago, uh, Simon Hess, who's a dear friend and collaborator for many years, and I were discussing commissioning a book about the seemingly irresistible rise of Sinn Féin. And um, we talked about a lot of people, and we thought that Maria Cal would be an extraordinary and interesting uh, person to write such a book. Um, so I, I'd never met Maria. Uh, I emailed her out of the blue and persuaded her to write that book. She said, yes, she would. And uh, later, she must have thought, be careful what you wish for, <laughs> because um, uh, it, this book has transformed. I mean, as many of you who know Maria much better than I did are aware, she is a fiercely determined person who does things her own way. And instead of a <laughs> instead of a conventional journalistic book on uh, the rise of Sinn Féin and its implications for Irish democracy, she went deeply into her own story, um, one that many people might think they know about, but which is explored in this book in utterly compelling and unforgettable and I think very important detail. It's full of truly terrible moments of character portraits of people who are alternately and sometimes simultaneously brutal, cruel, embarrassed, evasive, dishonest, well-meaning and decent. There are some very decent people in this book, but there are many people who have uh, a lot on their consciences. We all know it was done to Maria, which would in most lives have been bad enough. Uh, but it was what happened later, the extended black farce of the IRA's internal inquiry that makes Maria's story so significant and makes her book an important parable for our time in Ireland. Uh, look at how an institution behaves uh, when its members are accused of sexual violence and other crimes. It's a test of its fitness to be trusted. What other organization could survive the revelation that it conducted its own grotesque in investigation into allegations of rape and allowed the abuser to confront his victim in the upstairs room of a private house in Belfast? Yet we live in an age when two of the most valuable commodities for anyone seeking power are Teflon and amnesia. Uh, 
But as we know, Maria fought back and continues to fight, as this book so richly demonstrates. Um, and that is what, what I think we have to celebrate tonight, despite the pain and the hurt and the lies. Um, I, I want to add, before turning over to Eamon McCann, the great Eamon McCann, uh, I want to add a personal note of thanks to Simon Hess, to Declan Heaney and all their colleagues for their incredible support over so many years. And I want to thank Maria for her good humour and patience in putting up with my countless edits and suggestions and badgerings and uh, for giving us such a terrible, powerful and brilliant book. I'm proud to publish it and I'm proud to, proud to know Maria. Thank you. Is this okay, eh? All right. Uh, as, uh, I don't know about the rest of it, but I can't wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> it'll come out in a minute. It'll come out in a minute. It's, uh, 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 but as it, you were dead right, that reference to people who can be full of threat and horror and decency all at the same time. I, I come from... Rossville Street and the Bogside, right in the middle of the Bogside where Bloody Sunday happened. I know a lot of people who joined the IRA. You couldn't come from 10 Rossville Street and not know a lot of people who had joined the IRA. Most of the people I know who joined the IRA did so for decent reasons. Decent reasons. There might have been one or two who did it for power and because they wanted to be involved in violence, but very few, and I didn't know them. I, all the people I, if I would surround myself with them now, I think I would get on well with them, even now, even if I was revolted by things that they had done, because I'm aware of why they did it, the context in which they thought it was okay to do these things. And it's because, you know, it, it, more or less explicitly, but in general terms, they believed in their hearts that they were part of an army of the Irish Republic, and that they were waging war on behalf of the legitimate authority, the Irish Republic. And that's, it, 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 it sounds glib when you say it in a phrase, it's very, very important, it seems to me, when you try to discover the content of Republican ideology and the way in which that works to free people, so to speak, to do things that in ordinary life they would never contemplate doing. That's one of the reasons you get, I, I, I know a lot of decent people who did a lot of time 14, 15, 16 years, and are now dissidents, as they call them. Dissidents was usually taken in the mainstream press to mean violent people who want to continue with a clandestine armed struggle. That's not the, 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 the case with the overwhelming majority of so-called dissidents that I would know. There are people sort of, who don't believe in the armed struggle anymore, not because they've had, or uh, not primarily because they have suddenly begun to feel moral revulsion about the use of violence, but because they came to the conclusion that it hadn't worked and wouldn't work and was never going to work. And that can be a very disillusioning thing, particularly if you were involved in a lot of pain and pain endured as well as inflicted sort of through your involvement in uh, uh, a, the arms struggle. It's, um, you know, it requires a pretty tight and coherent ideology to enable decent people to do horrible things. You know, all that people might do, there's thugs all over the place, you know, who will uh, uh, inflict violence on innocent uh, uh, people, but to inflict the ultimate violence on individuals that you've never met before, uh, that takes real belief and a real ideology. Otherwise, you'll go berserk and do it. Eddie Gulliher, some of you might have heard of, Eddie was for a time a friend of mine, disappeared to the continent, haven't seen him in the last 10 or 15 years. Eddie, them, maybe might be too young uh, for the name to ring a bell. Eddie, he was actually the adjutant in the 26 counties for the IRA. He went to jail for an attempt to uh, free a, a, a young woman who was a member of the IRA. Bridget, what do you call her? Uh, 
Christ. Oh, Rose Dugdale. Fuck me. You know, I never thought it. if she was here now, she'd come down sort of and swoop me for forgetting her name. You know, but anyone that they get her out of uh, Mount Joy and the whole, whole series of it, and that he kidnapped, uh, along with Marion Coyle, dairy woman, who's a nice woman, uh, along with Marion, they kidnapped Dr. Tita Herima, who was the manager of a Dutch factory, Ferenka, in uh, the Shannon Free Trade area <laughs> at that time. But I remember, so they got the new area, and I remember it from Donegal. And he was, not patronizing him, but he was a most charming fella. He had a twinkle in his eye from morning to night. He's a lovely guy, uh, Eddie Gallagher. He too had did very strong things. You can't be that high in the IRA without having earned this every step of the way. But uh, I remember talking to Eddie about the IRA and some things that had happened in uh, uh, Belfast. He wasn't in the IRA at this stage. He had long after that. And uh, I was talking about the Republican tradition. And I said, you know, how come you were so motivated by the Republican tradition came from rural Donegal? It wasn't much of a I won't give the whole story of how Eddie came to be in the IRA, but it's a really interesting story. But he said to me, uh, 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 we were talking about the ideology of Republicanism and a couple of very strong things that happened in Belfast. He says, what do you tell you, Ewan? He says, those boys in Belfast were never Republicans. He said, they were only fighting for their streets. Now, Fighting for your street is not necessarily an ignoble thing to do. In fact, on occasion, it can be no more than a neighborly duty to defend your streets against hostile forces. So many of us were involved in that level of struggle sort of, uh, uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Sometimes I dread to count the uh, years before I realized. I was talking to somebody a couple of days ago, and I stood myself talking in intimate terms. And we said, when was that? When was that? And he was at school, blah, blah, blah. And I realized. It was 65 years ago. And I said, holy Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, I never thought I'd see that. Hey, at, uh, uh, what was I talking about there? Oh, yes. About, it says, it, it, it's only, uh, it, they were only fighting for their streets. Now, it, 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 everybody that I know in the Bogside fought for their streets at the time of the Civil Rights Movement and the Battle of Bogside and the period leading up to and after Bloody Sunday and so forth. We're fighting for your streets. The thing that we all did, we all did, and it wasn't a matter of duty; it was a matter of neighbourliness. Of course, you had to do it. You know, sort of in the morning after internment, and you used to have a Johnny White to the OC of the official area at the time, and there a very close friend of mine, a dear friend. I miss him still, Johnny. He died about ten years ago, you know, and, and he had been uh, uh, dragged from his bed, you know, and from his family, and interned. You know, of course, of course, the whole area exploded with anger. We all knew these people. You know, when the Brits were talking about these evil people that had to be rooted out, extirpated from society, and so forth, these were ordinary, decent people who were our neighbours. And so, so, of course, people turned out and defended them and threw stones and kept the cops out, you know, and created free dairy. Absolutely. I'm proud to have been part of that. No qualms about it at all. And was it violent? Of course it was violent. It was defensively violent. And that happened in Belfast as well. The raids that people had against the Brits, against the northern state, and so on, was not only understandable, it was inevitable. It was natural. It was, I, at that time, in the very late 60s and the early, uh, early 1970s. And there wasn't, as Eddie said, it wasn't an ideological thing. It wasn't that people had listened, read a book, listened to a lecture, or sat and contemplated the world and come to the conclusion that what was needed was a, a, a clandestine organization to fight an armed struggle. That wasn't it at all. It was maybe one or two people who had that sort of intellectual development into belief in the armed struggle. But for the vast majority of people, it wasn't that. It was fighting for your streets. It was getting... Father Dennis Fall, he was the chaplain to a uh, Catholic chaplain in Long Cash for many years. And a very moderate man. The, to my mind, not just moderate, sort of, I would call him a, a right wing, sort of a, a, a boy. You know, but he's a nice man. And he did a, a, his job sort of at Long Cash when there's not many people wanted to be associated sort of with the Republican uh, uh, prisoners. But Father Fall, again, you know, sort of like uh, Eddie Gallagher. I remember talking to him about uh, people fighting for United Ireland and the tradition going back to 1916 and so forth. I said, no, 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 no. About 10 no's. He said, that's not it at all. He said, people joined the IRA because their mother had been insulted in her own kitchen by the fucking Brits. You know, our father down his father. And he was right. That was right. You know, that's what happened. So you had sort of a... a you know, a mass uprising, a genuine mass uprising, fueled by popular anger 
against what was happening in the North. And it's true also that the Catholic community had been oppressed and downtrodden for half a century ago. And there was that anger, historical anger, to be taken into account as well. There's a difference between all that, a difference between all that and the Republican armed struggle. The Republican armed struggle a, was a, a natural, if you like, but not inevitable extension of what was happening in the late 60s and the early uh, 1970s. And, uh, if I can go on too long, just uh, t oh, no. tell me, sorry. The, uh, 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 thinking about these things, you have to have some respect for the Republican ideology, and there is an ideology there. Now, it's not the case that there's these mad people who have poured onto the streets filled with nationalist sort of fervor and started to shoot. But that's not a, 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 the way it happened. If it had happened like that, it would have been over sort of, uh, uh, in a few weeks. There is an ideology there at the heart of it. It was a very, very minority ideology in the midst of the civil rights movement, in the midst of the battle for free dairy, and so forth. There were people, of course, there were people who said, this, we need the, the Irish Republic, that's what's missing here, that's what's causing our problems. But they were a minority. You could know them. I remember them. I'm not attacking them. Like Sean Keenan, Prunches O'Meanan, you know, Jerry Doherty, the Bird Doherty, and Derry and so on. You knew them, and you knew a couple of families who were the IRA. That's, uh, that's all that they were. But they, had, they were carrying an idea which, over those tumultuous years, became sort of the idea, the ideology, the heart of the ideology behind the arms struggle. And was this, this is what I'm talking about. If you look at you know, our national liberation movement around the world and over the, over the uh, uh, decades, where they say that our attention is we want to, you know, we want to free Kalimantan. You know, Nagorno-Karabakh is a good example sort of, uh, of what we're having, a long buried sort of, uh, a struggle and sense of frustration that your nationality of your communal identity is being denied and then suddenly uh, uh, erupting. It's all out there. The difference with Irish republicanism, certainly sort of for over 100 years, has been that republicans were not setting out to achieve the Irish republic. They were setting out to defend the Irish republic. And there is a difference. Because implicit in Republican ideology, at, at the heart of the people who are sort of ideologues, sort of a, 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 was sort of a belief that the Republic was an actual existing entity. It wasn't an aspiration. It was reality. The Republic declared in 1916. And Patrick Pierce stood on the steps of the uh, GPO. He didn't say we're aiming for a united Ireland. He said we are the provisional government. The Republic hereby claims the allegiance of every person Sort of uh, uh, in Ireland. It was that claim that it's just, if you think about it, if you genuinely believe, so many people did, that you're fighting sort of a legitimate struggle, that the people fighting it are a legitimate, a properly constituted force for the uh, Republic that you're talking about, then ask yourself what happens in any other war, in the midst of another war, if somebody deserts, if somebody is found to be given information to the enemy, what happens? What's the punishment for that? It's treason, isn't it? The punishment for that is death. Oh, and British imperialism, French imperialism, everywhere they operated like that. It was death to disobey, death to desert. Uh, there. So, you know, it, 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 like everybody else, I imagine, I sometimes shivered with distress and disgust when I would read about bodies being found thrust up sort of on lonely roads. They included people, that, I know a lot of people, like I, I know people whose bodies, I had friends whose bodies were found up above the Letterkenny Road out of Derry between Derry and Donegal, and photos, photographs released of his naked body sort of thrust up and so on. And you think, how horrible, how horrible, how horrible. But that was done in pursuit of defending the nation. Somebody who had betrayed the nation, given information to the enemy at a time of war, that was the punishment. And that's the point that I'm making is that that's not all that unusual in wars. If you genuinely believe we are the legitimate government, we're a properly constituted authority. So, so all that, sort of, when, when you, when you uh, uh, latch that ideology onto the raw anger underneath, the legitimate anger of people who were mad, sort of and, uh, looking for revenge, sort of at what had been done to the communities, and uh, you know, that fueled the idea. This could never have happened. The last 50 years, whatever it is, sort of could never have happened if it was all down to ideology. You know, intellectuals could sit in uh, back bars and, uh, and discuss ideologies. They, uh, 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 what fueled 
what gave life to that ideology was the genuine anger at people, at the genuine oppression which they had suffered in their, uh, in their own lives. So those, that combination had proven to be absolutely destructive, sort of all judgment and so forth. So people imbued with that, to give you a dozen quotes, sort of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, people, I'm not talking about great leaders of republicanism or historical figures and so on, ordinary people in the streets, they would know, would say that. Why, for example, if you meet, if you see sometime, you're walking along the street, and there's a, ba a, a back entry, and you pass the entrance to the back entry, so to speak, and there's a couple of people, and you know them, you know them, battering some kid with hurly bats. You know, a puni you have chance upon a punishment beating. And when you sort of challenge these people afterwards, I didn't challenge them on the spot, there you are, it occurred the same as everybody else, but the first chance I got to say, Oi, what was that about? You've no right to be doing that. And somebody said to me, Eamon, all we were looking for was a bit of respect. A bit of respect. Why did he expect respect? Why was it uh, assumed that there would be respect involved? It's because of the perception, the self-perception of the guys who were doing it as that they were, had a legitimate cause, that they were the carriers of it, that they had a democratic mandate, if you like, you know, a uh, 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 set out in the proclamation. That's why they were doing it. And they believed that they were defending. See, if you're, if you're, if, if, if you're in a war, if you're in a war, not only is it an offense you know, to give information to the enemy or to go over to the other side of the enemy, it is also offensive to be disrupting sort of the society on whose behalf, so to speak, the war is being conducted. You know, so he, 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 that's why you sort of you have, for example, there's another wee incident. Uh, 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 sorry, I've got to stop me if I'm rambling on too long. I'm Remember, in a <laughs> that's all right. As, uh, uh, no, there's a, a the Dunlow Bar at the bottom of Waterloo Street in Derry, which is just adjacent to uh, uh, the bog side. There was an argument about this years ago. Uh, uh, I remember, and there's a fellow there, he was a tough man, didn't know him, sort of as a hard nut, sort of in Derry, and he uh, gave the people he was arguing with a lot of drink involved, he gave them a smack, he smacked them around, and he was tough, he got away with it because he was a rougher or better fighter or whatever uh, than these people. He was ordered to leave the town the following morning at gunpoint. Why? The guy was in the IRA. You couldn't have the army of the Republic being treated with that sort of disrespect at a time like that. So that, was a, that is a justification, not one that I would accept, not one that Maria uh, would expect, but taken sort of in the context of the thinking that uh, people were in the middle of, that was a good reason. You know, if I say we can't allow people to be slapping the IRA people around, how would the community respect them after that? Look up to them, take orders from them. So there's a connection between the ideology of republicanism, the one hand, stretching through to uh, uh, what happens in pubs and Waterloo Street on a drunken fr uh, Friday night. All that is together. What Maria's book has done, has done more eloquently than anything else I have read, is to simply to describe this process, to describe the way these things happen in relation to uh, 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 herself. You know, and it's, if I may say so, Maria, I think that the, what really stands out in your book, what makes it a great book, I started, it's, not, it's not the poetic phrases, it's one of the few of them, a couple of them, and it, uh, 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 it flourishes and all that. It's the relentless, dogged detail of the day-to-day -day life that you had to lead when you got into conflict with or when you were uh, uh, thrown at the mercy of the official Republican machine, the, well, the official provisional Republican uh, uh, machine. You can't be too careful with this. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, that's, it. that's what makes uh, uh, Maria's book, I think, valuable and a genuine and valuable historical uh, uh, a, a text. You know, it's a, and uh, a, you know, it's also important. I'm going to stop in a minute. You'll have to speak. Is that kind of oh, carry on. <laughs> no, it's also the case that when, you, when I think sort of about the book and think about the whole case of Maria and. Uh, the Ra sort of and uh, Bobby's story and the whole thing in Park Wilson and, uh, and, and, and reading the whole story. Anyway, in terms of freedom, in terms of freedom, ask yourself if you read it and do read it, you know, where's the freedom in this book? Where does it shine through? What are the sort of examples of the free spirit in this book? Where is it? There's not very many. There's not very many. There's no freedom and hardly any involved. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. 
Freedom is not something which can be delivered. This isn't an Irish point. It's a general point. It's common sense. Nobody can deliver freedom to anybody else. The idea that the IRA would deliver freedom to the people of the Falls and the people of the Bog side is absolute nonsense. A woman's thought should tell you that. Nobody can give you freedom. You know, men can't give women freedom. <laughs> I mean, if her freedom is in his gift, she is not free. You know, so, and it, it has to be the act of people themselves. It has to be... Uh, uh, people must perforce slough off the oppression of ages themselves, and then they'll feel free. You're not free if somebody comes along and says, well, fought the armed struggle for you, sort of in terms of the ancient tradition of Irish people fighting for, to get the Brits out. I have proof of getting the Brits out. Fuck them. You know, it's a, 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 but that actually doesn't deliver freedom to anybody. And one of the contrasts that shines through, shimmers through the surface of Greensburg uh, is the contrast between the idea of freedom and the actuality of oppression that the people uh, purporting to deliver freedom are happy to oppress people into supporting them. I mean, what a grotesque, sort of tangled sort of form of morality and even of ordinary logic uh, uh, that is. So I think that, you know, uh, one of the conclusions I hope people draw from reading Maria's book and, uh, is that it might, uh, it, 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 to understand you as a woman, a woman, you know, sorry, because that, I would have, should have talked about that from the start, and that's it. But anyway, uh, I, as a woman surrounded by sort of a male organization, sort of a male uh, uh, army, you know, it's sort of that, uh, it's an extreme example of the oppression of women. An extreme example of the oppression of women. You know, and women are oppressed everywhere. So, I mean, this is sort of, the book should be read in that context, but it's an example, it's an example of the oppression of women, as well as all the other contradictory things sort of that, uh, 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 that I had uh, uh, mentioned. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, okay, I won't go off on one and that, I'll, I'll never stop, but women have been oppressed for thousands of years. I said, and what's more, it's not like there's 10% of them and they're not being given 10% of the jobs and so on. There's 51% of people, white women are 51% of men, are only 49. And this keeps quote, I don't know who counted this, but nevertheless, uh, 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 it's a, big, it's a big number. The fight for freedom, here's the point I'm making. The fight for Irish freedom has to include the fight, uh, the fight for the freedom of women, the freedom of poor people, the freedom of ethnic minorities, the freedom of the young people, the freedom of the elderly. Freedom, freedom has to be freedom for everybody. And as I say, that can only be achieved by people themselves rising up and taking uh, freedom. That is in contrast with, in contradistinction to, it is incompatible with the idea of a clandestine army delivering freedom. So as I say, I'm quite happy to acknowledge, and I must acknowledge, that the majority of people I know who were involved in the clandestine struggle were decent human beings doing things that they believed were uh, a consonant with the conscience of them sort of, and of other people uh, uh, around them. And I think, I hope, I hope that Maria's book will spark a real debate about this and a real argument about it, because after all these years, it still has to be done. After all these years, the idea of whether we proceed, sort of whether we led either by paramilitary leadership or political leaderships, but by people who are making decisions for people, either we do that or we do it ourselves. And there's a, 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 a huge, sort of a crucial political difference between the two. So read Maria Cahill's book and earn yourself a wee bit of freedom. That's all I've got to say. Hello. I want to say thank you to Eamon because he came up tonight on the train and he's going back on the train and he's, it's a flying visit so I really appreciate the fact that he did and I also, looking around, I can't see everybody but I see faces here and there, I also want to extend a very warm welcome to the eclecticism in the audience tonight. Is that a right word, Editor Neil? <laughs> Can I say it? it's eclectic? There are people here from all walks of life um, I see a lot of people who I know and other people who I don't, but there are very welcome people here from uh, the area that I come from, see the likes of Ricky, who will understand, may not agree with everything Eamon said in relation to that. He, he agrees with every word, so there you go. There are other people here who are, <laughs> who are, who are extremely welcome, who are here from the loyalist community. And I am very, very happy to see friends of mine from the Shankill, from Bangor and further afield. There are people here from the unionist community. I see Doug Beatty over there. I see other people. Mark Durkin is up there, who was an incredible help to me um, from the very start, from before 
I use my voice and there are people here who are ex shinners they're peelers, I can see. You know, so we have we have people from, from all over and I think that's important to acknowledge because of anything the help that came my way came from all angles, from everybody, and it was something that I when I went to speak to people originally I spoke to every political party. The only party which didn't back me at the point when going public about child abuse, unfortunately, was the party who denied that it had happened, or half denied that it had happened. Um, Gretti is also here with Eamon. Both Gretti and Eamon were uh, people who did help me from the start. I didn't really know you as I knew you. I had, uh, had conversations with Gretti before. I've always loved Eamon McCann because he's an upstart, and I like upstarts. I see Tim Atwood. There you are. I was looking for you <laughs> all night. Um, Eamon took on... Uh, Roy Greenslade at a point in time when people were afraid to put their head up above the parapet on what was happening with me and when Greenslade wrote some particularly vicious articles in the Guardian newspaper which he later, um, well he didn't apologise for them, the Guardian newspaper did but, uh, and they uh, removed them. Both Goretti and Eamon tackled not just Roy Greenslade online which I appreciated along with people like Malachi O'Doherty and Ruth Dudley Edwards. See there's the eclecticism coming in again. But they also took on people from within the community that Eamon is speaking about, and I think that that is important to acknowledge because a lot of people said what happened to you, Maria, was terrible, and a lot of people said, you know, it should never have happened. There were very few people at a certain point in time, maybe within the initial days of it, because they were still waiting to see what way the, the land lay before they would actually say anything. And Eamon and Gretty both challenged me. I remember a very vicious blog that went up that said that I had enticed my alleged rapist with my virginity that that was the level that we had sunk to and it was a guy from East Belfast who was on the periphery of Sinn Féin who wrote it we didn't find that out for a number of years but it it was an appalling blog to put up about anyone and at the time there were very prominent Sinn Féin members in Derry some of it is in the book who were commenting not very nice comments online and I really appreciate Gretti and Eamon the support that you gave to me. Now, I haven't said that. I'm going to take issue with some of what you said because it wouldn't be me if I, if I wasn't going to take issue. And it, I agree. I think that, look, my grandfather was interned three times. Um, my father comes from a family which is fairly well known. You know, I've spoken about it publicly. I, of course, am going to say that the members of my family who got involved in what they got involved in, the ones who did, thought that they were doing the right thing. And I think they would consider themselves fairly decent and I think the people in Ballamurphy who know and grew up in Ballamurphy would think the Cahills were a decent family but I also think that there were an awful lot of people and you talk about people doing despicable things I think despicable things were done right across the board and sometimes people use the excuse that they were fighting for a united Ireland and they, they maybe weren't some of them were trying to reclaim that respect that they were looking for maybe because who knows maybe somebody got bullied in the schoolyard one day and decided they use that excuse for the rest of their life. And sometimes people on both sides did terrible, awful, inhumane things. And there isn't any excuse for it. That's my opinion. People, we could argue or talk about it till the cows come home. But I understand completely where you're coming from. And I think Belfast and Derry are also two very different places. I love Derry. I moved there with my child in the middle of the court cases. And I would love to go back again someday. Because the welcome that we had from people like Mary Brown and others was... Um, spectacular actually uh, at a point in time she had to teach me how to shop for clothes if anybody knows Mary she can shop that she drops but she takes you out for about five hours looking for a loaf of bread you know so um, I found that it, it was a much more easy going place in Derry than what it was in Belfast and I think that you will recognize this yourself Bernie from Ballamurphy it can be a very gritty place to be in you know I describe it in the book as being an almost a self-sufficient insular community and it was extremely enjoyable to be around. You have loads of cousins, you know, you have an uncle, uncles there, aunt, you have neighbours, nobody locks their doors and everybody's in and out, you know, borrowing things like butter and sugar. And, and it's that type of uh, community that is thrown together that really has to survive. But within that then, what you also have is the secrecy in Omerta that comes uh, with it and the isolation whenever you step outside the parapet and try and put it a fact into the public domain, which is then challenged. And I, I think that Ricky will understand that too. So it's a very waffly way of saying 
yes, I think we all um, we all have different, what's the word the Shinners use, narratives about what happened. We all have different beliefs and people have different belief systems, but we also then have to challenge sometimes the excuses that people hide behind. I don't think we differ on that. Now, let's talk about the book. <laughs> um, I probably have no idea how we ended up at this point tonight. I mean, <laughs> I spoke to Neela a few years back. I had done pieces of writing, and I tried to explain this towards the end of the book. I was very, very frustrated at times, particularly three or four year court case where you felt that it was going to collapse at the end. And look, we all, um, most of us know what happened there, none more so than me. Um, that was devastating for me because after already investing yourself in a criminal justice system that is supposed to deliver justice for you, like very many rape victims or abuse victims who go through the process, it doesn't actually deliver at all. But to understand that it never will deliver, I think, and there there was always possibly a hope out there that someone like Marty Morris would be held accountable. And I think he's been held accountable, but he's had to be held accountable in a very different way, and that was through putting his face on the television so that people can take an informed decision as to whether to let their children near him. And I think that, you know, we have this debate recently uh, over a high-profile case in the media, and people talk about trial by media. Sometimes trial by media is the only avenue, unfortunately, to people like me when they are trying to get justice because they're our own justice system, and I see my very good... Uh, lawyer, and I, I saw one earlier also, uh, Joe Rice is here tonight. You know, Joe, the amount of help that Joe and people like Frank O'Donoghue and Neona Ask and Michael Sinclair, Connor Houston, you know, way, way from the start put in in terms of helping me with my case was phenomenal. Um, but essentially you felt like you were fighting it yourself. And I think, Joe, you would recognise that too. Like, I yap, I try and hold people accountable. That's what I did. I emailed and when Sir Keir Starmer then came in to do a review, there was a body of evidence there for him. If it hadn't have been for that body of evidence, if it hadn't have been for the emails, the email trail, God knows what the PPS would have said in terms of that, because I think we were asked to clarify a number of points in relation to what people were saying and, and what actually happened. So that's me off my soapbox now. It really is about thank yous. Um, Neil Belton is an extraordinary editor who has published... Um, some extraordinary books and I think that the courage that it, it takes sometimes again to put your head above the parapet um, gives you a bit of an indicator as to what a person's makeup as a human being is and I think Neil probably shit himself when, he, when I sent the manuscript through because originally it was supposed to be a nice uh, political analysis of a not very nice political party you know um, I couldn't write that book I mean I could write that book and I, you know people might buy that book and they would read it and I hope that they would think that, that I wrote a good book. This was different because it was personal and I think that we have had as a family unit a horrendous time. Um, I, my child is 13, she was 13 last week. Her name is Sarah, she's outside because it isn't appropriate really to bring her in at the minute. Um, I was pregnant with Sarah when I made my police complaint. So that gives you a bit of an indicator she was four at the point in time when the trials collapsed. You know, there's four years of her life gone, during which we had moved, I think, maybe six or seven times into different houses for, for various reasons. Uh, we moved cities, I moved jobs, albeit within the same organisation. We moved back again. You know, things were, were difficult. Um, and I think for my parents, it has been particularly difficult at times, um, who were there, who had the IRA in their living room, um, and who also were under control. And I think once the court cases collapsed and the Spotlight programme was done, and Jennifer O'Leary was a, a phenomenal reporter on that programme, and I think that the BBC, I mean, I have to thank them because they put out a programme with five not guilty verdicts and managed to name every one who was involved in it, and I, they treated me with care. I appreciated that. Once the programme happened and all hell broke loose and it became a, a political issue, north and south and in Westminster, and rightly so. I am coming to the point, Eamon, so I can talk more than you can. <laughs> yes. Once the shit hit the fan, right, <laughs> and we were having the meetings with the Taoiseach and, and Peter Robinson, First Minister, and, and things were, were going about, the big criticism that was levelled at me was, oh, you're being used, this is a political football, it's terrible what happened in terms of the abuse, but you know, the politics is a problem here, you know. One um, person who was involved with a rape um, an organisation which helps rapes, rape victims 
who isn't there anymore, rang me one day and said, you know, I've been asked to speak in the radio, Maria, but I have no problem speaking about the abuse, but I don't want to get involved in the politics of it. And that, for me, um, not to run the particular person down, but it's a really cowardly approach when you have a rape victim who is at the centre of a shitstorm and you need people to have your back. And I, I felt that there was something lacking within society. And I think Eamon touched on it at one point in time when he said, where are all the feminists? There were feminists and there were some very good feminists who were there, but in terms of an entity and as a block, there were sometimes people who checked their politics first before they checked what their morals were. And I think that that was a big, big problem and we need to get away from that. If it was the Catholic Church and if this case had have been a Catholic Church abuse case, people would have been screaming from the rooftops about bringing a victim into a room to face their rapist. This was about Sinn Féin and sometimes people checked their politics first before they check their morals and that was very, very unfortunate and it's still happening. And I think we have to learn how to challenge without fear or favour, without leaving it up to the victim to waive anonymity for life on a television programme to do so. Which brings me to um, Jerry Adams and Mary Lou MacDonald. And I wasn't going to speak about them tonight because sometimes I think it then becomes an issue and, and I see Sam McBride here, you know, sometimes you like people to hear the entire thing without the sound bite. So I've deliberately kept out of the sound bites and left those to Eamon. But I think that, well, I know that having been at the rough end of it, that I, I, we also have to learn how not to treat people despicably. And I think that I was treated despicably and it wasn't just me. And this is the reason why I mentioned my parents. Um, because it takes an awful lot of energy and stress when you're trying to deal with something like this. And that stress and energy affects other people also. Um, and I don't want to get upset about it, but the very, very worst thing in relation to all of that IRA forced investigation at the very first instance was not actually being brought in to confront uh, a horrible, horrible man. It was when the IRA decided they were coming to my parents' house to tell them what had happened. And I watched the hurt on my father and mother's face and I never want to see anything like that again. It was horrendous. So I have my biggest thank you, I suppose, goes to my parents. Um, to my child who's outside. She's waiting on you all singing happy birthday at her because she was 13 last week. <laughs> to my editor, Neil Belton, and also to Eamon and Gretty. And just, I want to balance the narrative actually because there isn't any other, I wasn't going to read and then I was going to read and then I decided no and then Eamon started speaking and I said, fuck it, I'm going to read. So, <laughs> excuse my language. Sorry, sorry, father. I don't know, where is my mum? She's over there too. God, no, I shouldn't. Definitely not a curse. Um, <laughs> The, uh, Martin McGuinness is probably the best example of someone who believed that he was doing a decent thing. And actually what we did was not only did we have the narrative from the very start about Martin McGuinness and, and we have the documentary evidence of him, but we also then have the retrospective narratives around him. And I think Malachi O'Doherty, who is an other, another upstart and he won't like me describing him as that, but he's a good one. Um, there was a poetry competition a few years back in which um, the Ma Martin McGuinness Peace Foundation, this, they decided to set up a peace foundation for a former IRA commander. That's what happens here. Um, and one of the things that they did was they decided to hold a poetry competition for everybody. So Malachi and myself were sitting, we were on the phone one night and Malachi had said, you know, I've written this poem. And I said, well, I might write a poem. And he said, but I'm going to enter it into this Martin McGuinness poetry competition. And I said, well, I'm going to enter mine into them, you know, because what can they do? Like, we're never going to win. But it just lets them know that people might want to write a different po kind of poem than Martin McGuinness was my hero. You know, he goes and drinks in Cafe Nero. So <laughs> I decided to write a poem and I was enraged after talking to Malachi there because I thought, like, will I send it or will I not? You know, sometimes it's a wee bit petty, but actually, and then I thought about my treatment by the Shinners and I went, I'm going to fucking send a poem because Martin McGuinness stood up after I went public and I think he did one of the most despicable things and it wasn't picked up on at the time. And, you know, you can read the book to find out what the history there is. He, uh, he stood in the television and he gave an interview to the Daily Mirror and he said, oh, I believe Maria was abused. So far, so good. And he then said, but I think it's unfortunate that she couldn't confront her rapist in court the same way Republicans are being confronted now. And if you want the window into somebody's character, those few lines were enough to do it for me. So I sat down in three and a half minutes and wrote, not a very good poem, but it is a poem anyway, and it kind of puts it down on the record. 
and he liked a bit of fishing, so I called it The Fisherman. And just before I read the poem, I entered the poem into the Martin McGuinness Poetry Competition, and Paul Kavanagh, who is uh, the partner of Martina, Martina Anderson, former IRA man, very nice man, wrote back and asked me, and I thought this was brilliant, would you like it in the under or over 18 category? <laughs> so uh, it was a lovely way of making a point, and I wrote back over 18 category, Paul, please, thanks. You know, it didn't win, but anyway, here it is. The Fisherman. They say one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Maybe that's true, though I don't remember much freedom in the initial days. Barricaded in, watching your man swanning about with his M60 glinting. Him, his gun, and a gaggle of curious kids poking their noses into what shouldn't have been their business. Washing on the line fluttered, marking the territory of the housewife, while a few yards away he loaded the boot with a bomb and smiled for the camera. This was his area, his and the housewife's. His life a juxtaposition, loved and loathed in equal measure, breaking bread for a sup of soup in one house, drawing blood in another, courting and killing, managed like old contemporaries. You'd wonder how someone could swing off the altar rails one minute and kneel and tell a woman, wrapping her rosary beads round her wrinkled hands the next, that her son was safe to come home. Rose's boy, coaxed on a wing and a prayer, found cocooned in a sheet with a bullet through his brain not long after. Whatever you say, say nothing. For decades, the fisherman cast his fly and reeled in the young men, the mad men, and caught and dumped the dead men. Later, the churchmen and the statesmen tripped over themselves to deliver a eulogy fit for a peacemaker, but not for a life taker. Some buried their chieftain, others their villain. All is not fair in love and war. Another woman couldn't bury a body when all that was left of her husband was a zip. You asked for poetry to remember his legacy. What rhymes with Patsy Gillespie? Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Sorry, because there's always a postscript. I forgot to thank Simon and Declan, um, who have been done really Trojan work over the last while from Gil Hess and also to Neil who got the book he didn't bargain for, but hopefully it'll do okay. Um, can I just do one more thing? Because I want to bring Sarah in here because I'm conscious she has been outside. I hope you have your... Joe. you're in a choir. You have a good singing voice there. She was 13 last week, but also Tim Atwood has a big birthday at the weekend, so it would be really good. Could somebody get Sarah for me, please? And then I'd definitely be quiet. She will be all embarrassed, but that's what mothers are for. <laughs> she might be secretly delighted. She, you'll never hear the end of it. I want her to hear this um, just whenever she comes in. Is she here? Sierra? <laughs> Come here a wee minute. So I just want to tell you something about this wee one because she is the absolute delight in my life. And I said, I dedicated part of the book to her. Everybody is so proud of her. She's very, very kind to people. She's also more stubborn than I am, so watch out, world. But she was 13 last week, so I said everybody would sing happy birthday to you. You ready? One, Tim, also. Ready? One, two, three. Happy birthday.